evening and welcome to the Literaturhaus Berlin. My name is Sonja Longolius and it's a great honor to be here tonight with all of you. Um, we are celebrating tonight an astonishing first novel, Das Unsichtbare Band. You already see the book here on the table. Um, it was published in Beirut in Arabic last year. It was uh, translated by Hamed Abdel Samad into German. It was published by DTV this year, but most importantly, it was written by Hanin Al Sayek, whom you see here in the middle. Please welcome Hanin Al Sayek. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank Congratulations you. to your outstanding debut. It's your first novel. Um, it's about an outstanding young woman from Lebanon born into a very religious Druze family and who against all odds fights for her right to education and her right for a self-determined life. It's a very impressive first novel. I already say this at the beginning. Um, and I promise you, you will all fall in love with Amal, her protagonist. Our acclaimed moderator tonight is Marie Kaiser, who will lead us through this evening. And you will hear the German passages from this book um, read to you by the actress Alexandra Zagurna, who's also recorded the, uh, the, uh, the audiobook of the novel, which is also astonishing that we have you here tonight. So I'm very happy. Please welcome all participants to the stage. And I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you so much for this introduction, uh, Hanin al -Sayel. How nice that you're celebrating the premiere of your debut novel with us here tonight. Um, das unsichtbare Band, we were talking about how to translate it in English, maybe the invisible bond, das gerade im DTV Verlag erschienen ist. Wir werden an diesem Abend eine Mischung aus Deutsch und Englisch sprechen aber versprochen kein Dinglisch, also wir beide werden uns auf Englisch unterhalten. Die Lesung wird heute Abend auf Deutsch sein. You describe the life of a young woman, or rather a girl, in a small, remote Druze village in mountainous Lebanon. Amal grows up in a strictly religious, strongly patriarchal society, in which she experiences early on that women have fewer rights than men. How much of your life is in Amal? Okay, good evening everyone. I'm so happy and honored to be here tonight and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, uh, those who read the book will um, can't help but uh, see the parallels between my life and that of Amal. That is because uh, her life experience draws heavily on mine um, however, in order to turn the story into a work of literature, I had to apply a range of um, literary techniques like merging characters, manipulating time, and even using uh, imagination to uh, fill the gaps. Um, uh, a lot of people asked me why I did not introduce it as an autobiographical novel. So this was one of the reasons. And the second reason is um, I wanted the audience to uh, receive it as a work of literature because um, this way they will be able to see maybe themselves in it and they won't be looking at it as just a report of somebody else's life. And I think this is how literature helps us by seeing ourselves and identifying with the characters of uh, the novel. Mm -hmm. I guess most people on the street that we could ask tonight in Berlin what they know about Jews' religion, they would know very little here yeah. in Berlin. As someone like you, an insider who grew up in the Druze community, which is so interesting, otherwise you could never have written such a book, I would of course like to ask you for insights into the Druze religious community. What is so special about this religion mm -hmm. that 
people that live remote in the mountains and yeah. people have a lot of ideas what they're doing there. <laughs> Yeah, when, uh, when we say minority, we're talking about less than 2 million people, like, worldwide. So, it is a minority. Uh, the Druze religion started a thousand years ago in Egypt. It has uh, historical ties with the uh, Shia Muslim, but later grew to become a separate religion. When we first talk about the Druze, of course, reincarnation comes into the... The discussion because uh, Jews believe in reincarnation and that Jews can only reincarnate as Jews. Um, as a common Jews, it, I find this interesting because as a common Jews, uh, um, people do not have to practice like certain rituals, uh, like fasting or praying. Uh, just. Um, another minority within the minority who choose to uh, commit totally to a religious life and live an austere kind of life have their own secretive rituals. And of course, it's needless to say that um, no one can convert into a mm -hmm. This is why they're still a minority. And um, no one can marry a Jews, or at least... Um, it's not like they don't uh, allow marriages from outside of the religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and only when, which is very particular about Druze religion. I learned that in your book. Only when you belong to this inner circle, you are allowed to read the book, the holy book of the Druze. Yes, and here I'm talking about the the minority mm -hmm. that choose to commit fully to a religious mm -hmm. life. Yes, this is why they only have those uh, rituals uh, and they are secretive. Mm -hmm. Was your novel also an attempt to counter this lack of knowledge about the Druze, which you probably encounter again and again when you tell people what your background is? I mean, my knowledge? Mm -hmm. I get to know more because I grew up in an... My, my, the whole family, the extended family, are all like among the, the, the people who commit themselves to the austere life that we've been talking about. So I know more, but I don't know everything. But eventually, religion extends to the life that we live. So it's not only in the book, it's the lifestyle. It's, it, it is integrated in, um, in everyday um, uh, behavior and views on life. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have um, a clearer perspective. Mm -hmm. Especially Druze women, they have to live according to strict patriarchal rules. What rules and prohibitions are they subject to? It, even when the religion secured a kind of um, equality, a certain type of equality between men and women, for example, they both have to dress in a conservative way, they both need to stay away from the pleasures of life and um, live a humble, uh, austere life. But the nature of the religious uh, institutions uh, in patriarchal societies uh, kind of uh, uh, puts women in a less privileged position. Mm -hmm. that, that's always the case. So, so uh, the religion, along with patriarchal societies, together they form this coalition that is not in the favor of women most of the time. Mm. It's very rare to have the perspective of a Druze woman in, in a novel. That's something astonishing for people to read. Why was it important for you to give those women a voice through your novel? Mm -hmm. Uh, what makes a writer is their ability to observe and to be empathetic. And writing this novel was a way for me to tell those women that I see them. I do not only see the suffering, the lost dreams, the unfulfilled potentials, but I also see the, the, the brilliance of those lives, the unconditional love they have for one another, and the... the the support um, they show. Um, this is what I called empathy, and this is a very good material for literature. Hmm. Yeah. That's true. Um, and there are very strong and very poetic images 
mm -hmm. in this novel. You're a poet, we will come to this later, yeah. but you can really feel it when you read the novel. Yeah, that's right. And so I'm wondering sometimes if some of the images in the novel are poetic images or of, if they're really inspired by your family um, history maybe. There's a very strong image in the novel that shows how dif the differences between men and women are practiced. Ahmad's grandfather, he had built a wall in his own house separating from his wife because he was no longer allowed to speak to her. Yeah. Is this a strong image for the novel, or does something like this really happen in Druze communities? Mm. Let me provide some context for those who haven't read the, the novel. So, um, the grandparents of Amal, they got divorced uh, in, at a later stage of their marriage, but uh, because she couldn't leave the house, and her children were like adults, and they didn't want her to leave, They agreed on building a wall separating the two parents. Um, and in the Druze religion, uh, people who are divorced are not allowed to see or talk to each other. And this is how they spend the rest of their lives living under the same roof, uh, but uh, not seeing or communicating with each other. This is, was a powerful uh, image in the novel. Um, it is not only true. Um, Uh, I used it as a theme uh, in the novel to, um, that stands for or that describes the fragmentation um, and the division that takes place in the lives of the family members. So that physical wall multiplied into multiple psychological and societal war walls that uh, defined the lives of the family members later on. And it is really heartbreaking but because they still feel love for one another and uh, they're knocking on the walls, but they're now not allowed. She's not allowed to speak to him because That's she's right. not allowed to hear her voice. That's correct. Mm -hmm. In the novel, you describe something that surprised me, how it is possible for Druze women to achieve a certain degree of self-determination because Amar's mother is allowed to earn money by baking and selling bread herself, which gives her power because she gets to decide what to do with the money. And she, sometimes she decides, I'm going to pay school fees for my daughters or visits to the doctor. That yeah. is something very expensive. What degree of freedom does that give the women? The kind of freedom that earning money uh, provides is like within the limits of that community. Because, you know, women can't get away, they can't like drive or uh, leave the village on their own. But as we can see in the novel, the mother of Amal, she got creative with the money that she earned. She used it to empower her daughters and send them to schools in order to have a better life, to better connect with the bigger world. Uh, and earning money also helps on a psychological level. Um, it helps women feel like they are restoring their dignity. Mm -hmm that they have a say, even if it's like a minor say in adding a room to the house or buying some new furniture, for example, but they still feel like they are contributing to decision-making in a way or another. Mm -hmm. To Western eyes, the story of Amal can seem like it took place a long time ago. Like, how do you feel? Because uh, you have had this life which which seem very archaic uh, in a way, and now you live as a modern woman who has studied, who published books, who lives in Berlin and Beirut, and a very, very different life. When you sometimes now think back to your childhood and your youth, how do these very different lives hold together? How do they connect for you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Writing the novel itself was a way of building a bridge uh, between those two lives to trace the development of that um, mountain girl who has come a long way. Uh, during, like, uh, throughout tough situations, um, I always remind myself that I remember myself of the journey, of the constant struggle 
to fit in um, foreign environments. Um, for example, in the novel, uh, we see Amal, uh, she described her emotions vividly mm -hmm. when uh, she compared herself to her colleagues at the American University of Beirut. Uh, her um, uh, tense character versus their laid-back nature, the way they are able to sit on the grass freely. And she used the image uh, 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 frozen chicken to mm -hmm. describe her state or how she thinks of herself or how she feels she is compared to them. Mm -hmm. And that is something that you can totally relate to sometimes still? Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, she tries to imi imitate their poses, but it yes. doesn't feel right because yeah, she's it has more to do like with, uh, I mean, with the background, with how we're raised, with our psyches. It's not about the way we sit. Eventually, that will determine who we are. No, um, Amal. We have to talk a little bit about her because we will get to know her in the first reading very soon. And she's still a child when she's married off. She's 15 years old and she's asked if she wants to marry. But as a reader, you do not really have the feeling that she has a choice because mm. um, she couldn't finish school if she wouldn't marry. And that's something that is the most important f for her is Get, getting a high school degree mm. and uh, learning something. What does it mean for a young girl to find herself in such a situation, to, to be put under such pressure by her family at <coughs> such a young age when she is barely aware of becoming a woman? Mm. The thing is, in, in religious uh, societies, um, as young girls, um, uh, We are raised to somehow think of ourselves as a burden, as a scandal that might take place at any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, the list of rules that a girl has to abide by, starting with the simplest things, the way she sits, uh, the right way to dress, uh, the right tone to speak, who she should associate with. All of these rules um, uh, somehow form the self-image of the girl uh, on the subconscious level. So when she grows up uh, and uh, her father turns her to the, like hands her to the first man that proposes, she won't be surprised because she already thinks of herself as a burden. She already thinks of herself as imminent danger, as something that might harm the family. Uh, so she'll just accept it. Might as well be grateful for it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I just have in mind the mother who tells her that her the way she laughs is scandalous, yeah. even if it isn't. And mm. uh, you can only imagine how self-aware you become when yeah. when you get those feedbacks all the time. It is very frowned upon for women to 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 laugh loudly in our societies. Mm. I don't know what kind of message or intimidation it gives away for, for men, like maybe she's wild or full of herself or all over the place, I don't know. But yeah, it's frowned upon. So all men and women in here are allowed to laugh uh, as loud as they Please. want tonight. <laughs> um, which is important to know is she agrees to this marriage, but she has one condition. She asked her future husband, Salem, To, yeah, it's like a deal. It's yeah, like a deal between true. business people. Um, she will only marry him if he allows her to finish high school, if he allows her to study um, at university in Beirut. And her husband, um, he has a little bit different interests. He, he wants to have a child. But uh, she doesn't get pregnant. And at the end of the school year, he forces her to undergo genealogical examination, an examination which traumatizes her and later even to an artificial insemination. And that's the point where you get to know Amal now. Wir lernen Amal jetzt kennen, also dieses Mädchen, das nie gefragt wurde, ob sie eigentlich Mutter werden will und eine künstliche Befruchtung über sich ergehen lassen muss. Und ich bin sehr froh, dass heute Abend Alexandra Saguna für uns aus das unsichtbare Band lesen wird. 
Sie ist Theaterschauspielerin, hat am Schauspielhaus Salzburg gespielt, ähm, Theater Altenburg in Gera war sie zu sehen und aktuell im Theater der Altmarkt in Stendal und immer wieder auch als Hörbuchsprecherin. Herzlich willkommen hier auf der Bühne, Alexandra Segunda. Auf dem Weg zum Operationssaal war mir zum Weinen zumute. Alles um mich herum kam mir wie ein Traum vor, aus dem ich so schnell wie möglich aufwachen wollte. Ich dachte an meine Mutter. Von ganzem Herzen wünschte ich mir, dass sie bei mir wäre. Und ich fragte mich, warum ich sie nicht gebeten hatte, mich zu begleiten. Ich dachte an meine Schwester Nermin, die immer schimpfte und fluchte, wenn sie mit unangenehmen Situationen konfrontiert wurde. Wenig später lag ich auf einem schmalen Bett im Operationssaal und trug einen weißen Kittel, der meine Brust bedeckte und am Rücken offen war. Eine Krankenschwester drückte meine Knie auseinander, eine andere nahm mein Haar und schob es unter eine dünne OP-Haube. Meine Zähne klapperten vor Kälte und mein Magen zog sich vor Angst zusammen. Ich starrte auf das große Deckenlicht über meinem Kopf, bis ich in einen meditativen Zustand hinüberglitt. Es war ein intensiver Moment und ich hatte das Gefühl, Gott näher zu sein als je zuvor. Ich spürte die Sauerstoffmaske über meiner Nase, meine Augen fielen zu. Das Licht verschwand, die Kälte verschwand, Gott verschwand. Ich wachte in einem kahlen, grauen Raum auf und hörte lautes Stöhnen. Als ich meine Augen öffnete, wurde mir klar, dass das Stöhnen von mir ausging, alles an mir war wie gelähmt. Ich schaute mich um und sah niemanden. Ich hob den Kopf ein wenig an, verlagerte mein Gewicht auf den Ellbogen und spähte in den leeren Raum. Es dürfte wie eine Stummfilmszene ausgesehen haben. Ein paar Minuten lang erkannte ich weder den Ort, noch wusste ich den Grund, der mich hierher geführt hatte. Ich schaffte es, mich auf die Bettkante zu setzen und die Beine in der Luft baumeln zu lassen. Dann streckte ich meinen Körper, bis meine Füße den Boden berührten. Als ich aufstand, rann eine Blutspur meine Oberschenkel hinunter bis auf den Boden, wo sie unterschiedlich große rote Flecken hinterließ. Ich starrte auf die roten Flecken und wollte schreien, aber ich wusste nicht, wen ich rufen sollte oder ob Rufen mir überhaupt helfen könnte. Ich blieb stumm. Fünf Tage lang habe ich nach der Operation das Haus nicht verlassen. Ich bin auch kaum aus dem Bett gekommen. Ich hatte Schmerzen, aber ich konnte die Quelle des Schmerzes nicht genau bestimmen. Wie bei einem Dach in das Wasser eindringt, ohne dass man die undichte Stelle sehen könnte. Einmal hatte ich das Gefühl, das undichte Dach zu sein, das niemandem Schutz bieten kann. Dann wieder fühlte ich mich wie das Wasser, das eindringt und die Zukunft der dort lebenden Familie ruiniert. Aber wie kann man gleichzeitig Täter und Opfer sein? Und wer in dieser Spirale bestimmt, wer wen beschädigt und wer in wen hineinblutet? Ich dachte an meinen Vater und seinen Vater. Ich dachte an meine Mutter und ihre Mutter. Ich dachte an den Embryo, den sie mir in die Gebärmutter einpflanzen wollten. Das Kind, zu dem ich eine Beziehung haben würde, die mit Schmerzen, Injektionen und Demütigungen begann. Wer wird das alles wieder in Ordnung bringen? Du kleines, potenzielles Wesen, das in einer modernen Klinik in der Hamra Street in einer Röhre liegt, während deine Mutter hier an die Decke starrt. Wie baue ich eine Brücke über den Fluss des Leids, um sicher zu dir zu gelangen? Und was ist mit dir? Wirst du das Regenwasser sein? Das Dach? Oder die undichte Stelle? Willst du wirklich ein Teil dieser Farce werden? Nachdem die Embryonen in meine Gebärmutter eingesetzt worden waren, verbrachte Salem die Tage damit, mich in, der, in all den Annehmlichkeiten zu verwöhnen, die sich aus der Hoffnung auf eine Vaterschaft ergaben und wünschte sich zutiefst, dass sich einer der Embryonen einnisten und als Baby in neun Monaten das Licht erblicken würde. Aber nichts von alledem geschah. Der Test, den wir zehn Tage nach der Rückgabe der Eizellen machten, war negativ. Im Blut lässt sich kein Schwangerschaftshormon nachweisen, sagte der Arzt in einem monotonen, mitleidlosen Tonfall 
ohne Rücksicht auf Salem, der unruhig auf eine gute Nachricht gewartet und viel Geld bezahlt hatte. Oder auf mich, das Teenagermädchen, das sich in eine Labormaus verwandeln ließ, um ein Kind zu bekommen, das es nicht einmal haben wollte. Ich bin noch nie ein fröhlicher Mensch gewesen, der einen Raum zum Strahlen bringt. Ich bin ruhig, zurückhaltend und spreche nur, wenn es nötig ist. Menschen, die mich zum ersten Mal treffen, merken sofort, dass ich still und ernst bin, aber nicht düster. Ich habe ein ungestümes Lachen, das man schon von Weitem hören kann und das meine Mutter skandalös nannte. Aber seit ich mein Elternhaus verlassen hatte, konnte kaum noch etwas dieses Lachen provozieren. Zumal Salem sich darüber empörte, wenn ich in der Öffentlichkeit lachte, weil er mein lautes Lachen peinlich fand. Während des gesamten Befruchtungsprozesses und in den darauffolgenden Monaten lebte ich zurückgezogen in seinem großen, kalten Haus, tat nichts anderes als nachzudenken und zu lesen. Das verwandelte mich in einen anderen Menschen. Ich horchte in dieser Zeit auf meinen Schmerz und versuchte zu verstehen, woher er kam und was ihn auslöste. Aber dieser Schmerz nahm immer wieder neue Formen an und verbarg sich hinter verschiedenen Gefühlen. Irgendwann verwandelte er sich in einen stillen Hass auf alles. Ich ging Menschen aus dem Weg und konnte nicht mehr mit anderen kommunizieren. Ich begann Hochzeiten, Feiern, Geburtstage und sogar Familienbesuche zu meiden. Ich verließ das Haus nicht mehr und wenn jemand zu Besuch kam, ignorierte ich die Türglocke. Als mein Schmerz in Wut umschlug, richtete sie sich gegen meinen Vater. Ich wollte mit Türen schlagen und die teuren Antiquitäten um mich herum zertrümmern, aber stattdessen rannte ich ins Bad, ließ kaltes Wasser über meinen Kopf laufen und weinte. Zigmal wiederholte ich, ich vergebe dir, Papa, ich vergebe dir, Papa, ich vergebe dir, Papa, bis mein Kopf taub wurde und das Weinen aufhörte. Die grausamste Version meines Schmerzes war die Scham. Sie verschonte alle anderen und griff nur sich selbst an. Die Scham hat mein Selbstbild zerstört und hat mich klein und unwürdig werden lassen. Im Versteck fühlte ich mich sicherer. Ich versteckte mich nicht nur vor den Menschen, sondern auch vor dem Sonnenlicht. Mein Körper hatte durch die Fruchtbarkeitsinjektionen zu schwächeln begonnen. Ich verlor an Gewicht und Teile meiner Backenzähne brachen ab, wenn ich Speisen aß, die zerkaut werden mussten. Meine Ernährung beschränkte sich in dieser Zeit auf Sagebrot und Thymian, das Einzige, was mir half, das ständige Übelkeitsgefühl zu bekämpfen. Und ich las und hatte Freude daran, meine Gedanken und Betrachtungen aufzuschreiben. Diese Art von Freude war etwas, das ich noch nie erlebt hatte. Das Vergnügen, das ich entdeckte, war nicht die Art von Vergnügen, die jemand beim Essen, beim Sex oder bei einem Ausflug erlebt. Vielmehr war das Vergnügen des Lesens oder Schreibens mit dem Flügelschlag eines Vogels vergleichbar, der in einer Ölpfütze feststeckt. Es war ein vorübergehender Zustand der Leichtigkeit. Als wäre der Stein, der mir seit Jahren im Magen lag, für einen Moment aufgehoben. Es war ähnlich wie bei Zahnschmerzen, die sich ein wenig bessern, wenn man auf den Zahn drückt. Eines Morgens wachte ich mit dem Wunsch auf, eine Zigarette zu rauchen oder mit hoher Geschwindigkeit Auto zu fahren. Ich durfte aber nicht rauchen, und ich wusste nicht, wie man Auto fährt. Also bat ich Salem, mir das Autofahren beizubringen. Nach anfänglichem Zögern sah er darin eine Möglichkeit, mich aufzuheitern. Er nahm sich jeden Tag eine Stunde Zeit, um auf der Landstraße mit mir zu üben. Bereits nach einem Monat saß ich selbstbewusst hinter dem Steuer und lenkte durch die Kurven, während Salem angeschnallt auf dem Beifahrersitz saß und eine Hand auf der Handbremse liegen hatte. Das Autofahren wurde für mich zu einem Ventil. Beim Fahren fühlte ich mich frei, mit heruntergelassenen Fenstern und aufgedrehter Musik. Dabei rauchte ich gerne heimlich eine Zigarette. Dieses Gefühl der Freiheit hielt jedoch nicht lange an, denn Salem machte eine Liste mit Orten, in die ich fahren durfte. Er erlaubte mir, meine Mutter in Ein Suda und seine Familie in Kaframla zu besuchen, und er legte fest, dass ich eine unserer Mütter mitnehmen musste, wenn ich in der Nachbarschaft einkaufen gehen wollte. Beirut oder andere Großstädte waren verbotene Zonen. Ich willigte in seine Bedingungen mit Anstand ein. 
Zufriedener war ich, als er sagte, du kannst nicht ohne Handy unterwegs sein, wir müssen dir eins kaufen. Seitdem rief ich ihn an, bevor ich das Haus verließ und rief ihn erneut an, nachdem ich an meinem Ziel angekommen war. Ich akzeptierte alle Bedingungen ohne Widerspruch. Die Grenzen, die er für meine Fahrten zog und das ständige Anrufen müssen, erinnerten mich an meinen Großvater Abu Ali, der sein Huhn mit einem langen Seil festband, so dass es auf der Suche nach Futter das Feld durchstreifen konnte, ohne es zu verlassen. Doch weder das Autofahren, noch das Lesen und Schreiben, noch Salims Versuche, mich aufzumuntern, machten mich wieder zu der Frau, die ich vor der gescheiterten Fruchtbarkeitsbehandlung gewesen war. Irgendetwas hatte die Art und Weise, wie ich mich selber sah, für immer verändert. Irgendetwas gab mir das Gefühl, dass mein Körper zu einem Gefängnis geworden war, in dem ich für immer gefangen bleiben musste. Ich misstraute ihm mehr und mehr. Es widerte mich an, wenn ich Fotos von mir sah oder wenn ich mich im Spiegel betrachtete. Wenn Männer mich bewundernd oder lüstern ansahen, erinnerte mich das an die Weiblichkeit, die meinen Körper zu etwas Begehrtem machte, und an die Gebärmutter und den schmerzhaften Befruchtungsvorgang, der mich erschüttert, gedemütigt und geschwächt hatte. Ich sollte ein Reagenzglas Baby bekommen, aber stattdessen wurde ich zur Reagenzglas Frau. Vielen Dank, Alexandra Sagona. Reagenzglasfrau, auch Laborratte, Test Tube Woman or Lab Rat. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are very strong words. Um, Mal feels like that after this failed attempt at artificial insemination. We just heard it. She feels that her own body is a prison, and the astonishing thing is her husband. Salem has never asked her how she actually feels about motherhood, yeah. whether she actually wants a child. He, he didn't even ask once. So she's supposed to get pregnant as quickly as possible as a very young girl at the age of 16 with artificial insemination. And we just heard how difficult this is for her, this procedure. Um, She's completely overwhelmed by this mm -hmm. situation. How did you experience this in, in your community? Is a, a woman's worth measured primarily by her ability to give birth? Yeah, the, the artificial insemination was uh, used as yet another example of how a woman's body can be used against her can be used as a tool to fulfill somebody else's dream, but not her own. Uh, motherhood takes up a major part in the novel. Um, um, there's also a line that says, I don't know if you remember it, it says that after the birth of the first child, uh, a woman becomes only a mother, but mm -hmm. the man remains a man, mm -hmm. even after he becomes a father. So the, the woman in those societies, um, in patriarchal societies, is not only defined by her ability to conceive, but also reduced to it. Mm -hmm. And this has been a haunting issue for me, along with another issue that has to do with motherhood, which is the connection between, between motherhood and guilt, mm -hmm. and how um, those two, um, like, they're inseparable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I talk to women from different nationalities, uh, different parts of the world, um, full-time mothers, um, mothers who have a job, or single mothers, or those who are still with their husbands. All of them share this thing, which is guilt towards mm -hmm. their kids. Not a single mother told me that she doesn't experience some sort of guilt. So um, those are questions, recurrent questions in the novel, and for me personally, as a personal interest. Mm -hmm. And thinking about motherhood, for her in the novel, she, Amal is thinking of her own mother's life also. Yeah. That makes Amal doubt whether she should become a mother herself, because 
you can really see with her mother the total subordination, self-sacrifice, yeah. um, which goes so far that she only eats the leftovers and leaves the good food for the rest of the family in order to humiliate herself, which yeah. is a good thing in religion. Yeah. Why was it important to you to, to, yeah, this, because it's a very, very strong, she's a very strong counterpart in the book, the mother. Mm. She describes how she was always, as a child, attached to her, her mother. She wouldn't let go of her mm. and is very connected to her, but also feels very guilty as a child of her mother because she turned her into a mother. Yes. I think the guilt starts when a kid, uh, a girl or a boy, when they see their mother unhappy. They kind of, I don't know how, but they kind of get the message that it's me. I'm the cause of her unhappiness. Uh, and maybe this is how we learn about motherhood, by how our mothers practice it, how they feel about it, the kind of people they are as mothers. This is how we learn subconsciously perhaps, about motherhood. And for me to witness this, I'm a very good observer, as you can see in the novel, mm. this was scary and terrifying. And um, having the chance to get away and to lead the life that I wanted made me with this feeling of guilt or maybe betrayal that I have gotten out, but she didn't. Mm. This was a very uh, painful feeling that eventually Amal had to uh, face herself with. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, a lot of readers uh, wrote to me telling me that they find the character of the mother a very interesting character. And I am aware that I haven't uh, dedicated enough um, space in the novel for, for the individual that she is. She was talked about in relation to her family, to her daughters, to the sacrifices, but not her as a person with dreams and a different character. Yeah. So you yourself are a mother. Uh, we right. know that from the very start because you dedicate your novel to your daughter mm -hmm. and you apologize to your daughter in the dedication. Forgive me because I could never be completely with you. I'm raising you and myself at the same time. Why was it important for you to dedicate this novel to your daughter? That's a very good question. Uh, of course, I wanted to share with her my perspective on life and how I experienced this life. Uh, as, a, as a very young kid, she, she started asking questions about the, the, the woman and the community. This is her family we're talking about. Uh, why can't they go to the beach with us? Why can't they travel? Why can't they... Um, why do they have to dress like that in a very hot weather? weather? Um, why can't they drive? And... Um, for, for a kid, for a 13-year-old or a preteen, um, it was hard for me to express or to, it's hard for her to fully grasp the, the richness and the um, harshness of the lives of those women. Um, especially that a lot of what happens in the lives of those women, as we can see in the novel, like from uh, the Am Amal's character and Ermin's character, a, a lot of happenings uh, take place underground. The victories, the breakdowns, uh, the brokenness, all of it is not discussed. No one knows anything about it. So writing the novel was a way of handing my daughter the blueprint of the lives of those women those are her family and her ancestors. It's important to know where she comes from, and it is important for her to know, uh, to appreciate the, the kind of life that she gets to have just because she was born uh, like uh, a while later. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to suffer needlessly. She doesn't have to go through battles in order to secure her, her very basic rights. Mm -hmm. You told me that the origin of this novel was a letter 
you were writing to your daughter? What kind of letter was this? And how, what, where was the moment where you, you felt, okay, this, this is going to become something I want to share, not only with my daughter. But, but yeah. As I mentioned earlier, uh, as you mentioned actually mm. earlier, I started off by writing poetry. Mm. Poetry is so good in a way that it helps you express your feelings and thoughts without totally being vulnerable or without um, getting naked. Mm -hmm. We, you do not have to address the issues that cause those feelings. You, you just get to you know, let out the frustration, the anger. Um, but then this wasn't helpful in uh, expressing the whole range of the issues that were um, worrying for me, the haunting questions. So I switched to writing a novel, but the, the, the thought of writing a novel was so intimidating, I didn't think I can do it. So I was like, okay, I have one reader, my daughter. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> the I'm most important reader. <laughs> I'm gonna use it as a way of like telling her, telling her maybe she's not a good observer. I mean, I got to observe, so I have the obligation to tell her things. And this is how it started. But then it took the form of a novel, and it became as such. Was she already allowed to to read the novel, or do you think she she should wait until she gets a little no. bit older? No, she attends an American uh, school, so um, her basic education, her main education is in English. Mm -hmm. So this is very advanced for her age, mm -hmm. and I don't think she's um, psychologically and mentally ready to receive such a novel. I would maybe, agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe and later when mm -hmm. she's an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it doesn't have to be a matter of course. She might mm -hmm. not want to to look at it like maybe later. Of mm -hmm. course, she will. Eventually. Really. I'm sure she will. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure she will. How difficult was the step from poetry to becoming a novelist? How did you find that voice? Because that voice you have in a novel, which is a very... Because she gets really Amal very close to us. Mm -hmm. you, you really get the connection. So you have the... Imp not really have the impression, okay, this is your debut novel. You, it's, it's really... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I got that a lot, especially from uh, critics in the Arab world. They was like, they were like, I mean, you can't tell it's a first novel, and I'm very humbled and happy by their the opinions of the professionals. Um, moving or switching from uh, writing poetry to 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 writing a novel, I, I wouldn't say it was hard, but it took constant attention to the kind of language that I'm using, I had to make, make sure that the flow isn't interrupted by too much symbolism or by this you know, coded, uh, mm -hmm. condensed language that we usually use uh, when we write poetry. So I had to be aware, but I wouldn't say that there isn't, that we cannot make space for poetry uh, in the novel. Because as you can see, there's a lot of it, but it's, it's, it, it is put in a way that serves the flow of the narration. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the novel, you describe how Amal is torn between her love for her family, her desire for freedom and self-determination. And I was thinking, yeah, it's the example here we have of a girl from a Druze community, but... Aren't you describing a situation that many women in Lebanon, for example, share, even if they belong to different religious communities? And is this maybe what you wanted to suggest with the title, The Invisible Bond? I don't know. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Actually, after I published the novel, the, the, the number of letters and messages that I got from women readers from across all Lebanon from from ultra uh, religious communities were it was overwhelming. Uh, uh, we're talking about, I mean, uh, from all religions, and we have 17, uh, yeah, you know, uh, religious groups. Mm -hmm. um, this tells me that we have a lot in common. Uh, we are similar in ways that we did not like realize. Mm -hmm. before. 
So yes, like women, even here uh, in, the, in the West, uh, a lot of women still share a lot of uh, the discrimination, I'd say, and the, the oppression, and sometimes it's not so direct. It's built mm -hmm. in. It's in the way we're brought up. It's in the way we feel about being mothers. So, yes, it is meant to bring us together mm -hmm. as women. Yeah, when you were earlier talking about men, when they become fathers, they still are men yeah. and women only are mothers. I yeah. think that's something a lot of women can here relate to, yes, today yes. can relate to. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful title and, and the message in the mm. title. Um, in the novel, you describe how difficult it is for Amal to apply to university, how strong this feeling is that education is something that she wants, but she isn't entitled to. Yeah. And how even as a mother of a little child, she really fights to go to university, mm. which is something that is difficult when you do it in the Western world, but it must be so much more difficult when you live in such a community. Um, how was it for you? How big are the hurdles you had to overcome to convince mm. yourself, I'm entitled to this education? Well, I still ask myself this question as to how I did it, but I realized that attending college for me was it was a major struggle. First, the resistance came from the, the men in the family. First, the father who wanted to keep the daughters away from the influence of the outside world mm -hmm. because that's, you know, dangerous. And then the husband who had different uh, goals and dreams. And uh, there were also psychological hurdles like, you know, that result from uh, being brought up in a minority, uh, like self-image issues or uh, feeling inferior, and then lacking the basic tools to function in a free environment. This was all foreign. This, was, this all took a lot of courage, uh, persistence, uh, and hard work to overcome. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the juggling of motherhood and housework and, you know, assignments, all of this, like, I, when I look back, I, I think, I don't know how I did it, but I'm glad, uh, glad I did. We are too, because otherwise we yeah. wouldn't <laughs> be able to read your book now. And uh, what is really astonishing about Amal is that she's not the character you might expect. Oh, I'm, she's this rebellious woman, she's a fighter from the beginning. No, she isn't. She has a lot of self-doubt. Yes. She's very uh, insecure. But mm -hmm. even this insecure woman that tells us she's an introvert and everything, she manages to stand up for her own interests more and more. So I really felt this story is also a message to all the women who think they are not self-confident, not strong enough. Mm. They too become fighters. Uh, I think um, that mm. might be the explanation why you got so many letters. Because That's correct. was that important for you to have such an insecure character that transforms with Amal? It was important first because it is the truth of so many women who grow up in minorities. I mean, I even got letters from different countries from girls, not necessarily Jews, but who grew up in minorities and they were like, you put your finger on a very sensitive issue, which is the, the feeling of inferiority. Oh yes, we feel the same when we go outside. And when we connect with the world, we feel that we are less, that we do not have the right to be there. So yes, um, the, the, the name Amal it means it translates as hope. Mm -hmm. And this was a message for, for every woman who is uh, enduring uh, this kind of um, circumstances. Uh, it is meant to tell her that uh, no one can uh, give you your freedom, but also no one can take it away from you because uh, freedom is, is not just uh, a thought or an act, it is rather a, a lifestyle and a way of being. And um, freedom starts with our belief that we deserve to be free, because without this, you cannot convince anyone that you deserve your freedom if you do not buy it first. And, um, and one must be ready to accept all the consequences that might follow. Mm -hmm. That's it, this was the message.
there comes uh, this very poetic image from the novel in my mind. It's this uh, butterfly that yeah. tries to to get out of the get out of of his uh, cocoon and uh, yes, and yes. Um, there's a man observing this and he tries to help the butterfly by mm. opening, mm. but the butterfly isn't able to fly because he needs to fight to get out, to become mm. strong and have... Exactly. Um, so is this... Um, yeah, it's th what's make, what makes your novel so poetic, but uh, is this what's... Yeah, what's it like for women? They have to do it themselves. Exactly, because if you just take a woman from her village somewhere in a rural area and put her in a city, she will totally be lost. She won't be able to find her compass. But... Uh, Uh, training herself um, to find the tools and forge her own tools to dig her way out will eventually help her function in the outside world because uh, she has a plan. Starting with forging the tools to get out is a plan in itself. Mm -hmm. So like, we should never underestimate the willingness of women who do that, who uh, dig their way out of closed places. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's an important turning point in the novel, a point at which Amal realizes that she can no longer live in her marriage. And this is triggered by a lecture at the university mm -hmm. by a famous writer who comes, the image of women in religious, and that changes everything for her. She realizes that the freedom the so-called freedom her husband grants her is not real freedom. Mm -hmm. um, that many women confuse it with freedom when the conditions of their servitude are improved. That's one mm -hmm. of the sentences that stuck with me from the book. Why is this false understanding of freedom such a big problem? Because women who complain about their marriages And again, in patriarchal societies, I don't know if this is the case somewhere else, but they always got asked very expected questions. Are you being abused at home? And then she would say no. Is he cheap? Is there no enough food on the table? And if she says no, then they would tell her, uh, is he cheating on you? And if she says no, then they wouldn't find any reason for her to uh, revolt. Mm -hmm. So to them, it's just those basic needs, as if you're in a prison. And she has no right to aspire for more, to, um, to want to have a soulmate, a lover, a good friend, a good companion, a person who she is willing to grow uh, old with. All of this is, is not even, uh, is denied. It's not even a question. For a woman to think about that, or to, or to get a divorce, uh, for for this reason. And Amal, yeah, she is like living in the golden cage a little bit. Um, wir hören jetzt noch einen Auszug aus das unsichtbare Band. Wir springen zum Ende des Romans. Amal hat eine Tochter bekommen, ganz ohne künstliche Befruchtung und überraschend. Rama heißt die Tochter. Aber sie stellt eben die Ehe in Frage, sie will sich von Salem scheiden lassen und sie macht etwas, was sie selbst, glaube ich, am meisten überrascht. Sie steht einfach auf, geht, lässt Mann und Kind zurück, sucht sich eine eigene Wohnung und einigt sich auf eine Scheidung, was aber natürlich bedeutet, dass sie ihre Tochter weniger sehen wird. Und Alexandra Sagurna liest nochmal für uns aus »Das unsichtbare Band«. Ich verabschiedete mich von meinen Eltern und dankte ihnen für alles. Dann nahm ich ein Taxi und fuhr zurück nach Beirut. Zu diesem Zeitpunkt war mir klar, dass zwar meine Kämpfe mit der Außenwelt beendet waren, aber in meinem Inneren ein Krieg ganz anderer Art tobte. Ich war mir unsicher, ob meine Entscheidung über das Sorgerecht die richtige gewesen war. Hatte ich all meine Energie darauf verwendet, mich vor dem Belagerungszustand in meiner Ehe zu retten, aber nicht hart genug um das Sorgerecht für meine Tochter gekämpft? Wir hatten eine Annullierung der Ehe unterzeichnet und die Tage mit Rachma untereinander aufgeteilt. Aber wer hatte Rachma nach ihren Wünschen und Gefühlen gefragt? Ich ließ zu, dass meine Gedanken mich erdrückten. 
Mein inneres Raubtier, das früher die Stimme eines Mannes gehabt hatte, hatte diesmal eine andere Stimme. Die Stimme des Mannes war verstummt und jetzt gab sich das Raubtier manchmal als meine Mutter und manchmal als meine Tochter aus, aber meistens sprach es mit meiner eigenen Stimme. Der Stimme, die alles über mich weiß, die Zugang zu meinen dunklen Räumen hat und nicht zögert, die Leichen auszugraben, mit denen ich in der Vergangenheit nicht fertig geworden bin. Wenige Tage, bevor ich meine Tochter zum ersten Mal seit Wochen wiedersehen sollte, machte ich mir Gedanken darüber, wie ich bei unserem Treffen Stärke ausstrahlen könnte. Ich dachte an die schwere Last, die sie tragen musste, und an die Spuren, die diese Scheidung bei ihr hinterließ. Was für Fragen würde sie stellen? Und würde ich in der Lage sein, sie zu beantworten? Ich weinte mich in den Schlaf, doch dann wachte ich wieder auf und hörte Rachmas Stimme nach mir rufen. »Mama!« Mama! Im Halbschlaf sprang ich aus dem Bett und rannte zur Tür. Wenige Sekunden später wurde mir klar, dass es ein Traum gewesen war. Ich lauschte erneut, um mich zu vergewissern, dass die Stimme meiner Tochter aus meinem Kopf stammte. Dieser Vorfall wiederholte sich immer wieder. Erst nach einer Weile verstand ich, dass mein Kopf mit mir ein Spiel spielte. Also antwortete ich auf die Stimme, während ich im Bett lag, in meinem Herzen. Deine Mutter kann dich hören, Rachma. Gute Nacht, Liebes. Ungeduldig wartete ich auf unser erstes Treffen. Ich begann mich darin zu üben, ruhig und gefasst zu wirken. Mir fiel ein, dass ich ihr ein Geschenk mitbringen sollte. Also ging ich in den nächsten Spielzeugladen und sah mich nach etwas Passendem um. Nachdem ich zweimal durch den Laden gegangen war, bemerkte ich eine Schachtel mit der Aufschrift »Sew it yourself«, also »Nähe es selbst«. Bei näherem Hinsehen stellte sich heraus, dass es sich um ein Set mit Stoffteilen handelte, aus denen das Kind seine eigene Puppe nähen konnte. Ich kaufte es. Ich wartete auf Rachma an der Haustür meiner Eltern und als sie ankam, rannte sie mit offenen Armen auf mich zu und rief, Mama! Ich umarmte sie und sagte ihr, wie sehr ich sie vermisst habe. Doch nachdem ich ihr all die Fragen gestellt hatte, die ich im Kopf hatte, legte sich ein tiefes Schweigen zwischen uns. Ich griff nach dem Spielzeug und gab es ihr in der Hoffnung, sie damit abzulenken und die unbehagliche Stimmung aufzubrechen. Sie öffnete die Schachtel und nahm den gesamten Inhalt heraus. Nachdem ich ihr erklärt hatte, wie man das Set benutzt, setzten wir uns nebeneinander und maßen, schnitten und nähten. Wir fügten die Teile zusammen, bis aus dem Stoffhaufen eine Puppe entstanden war. Dann nähten wir zusätzliche Kleidung für die Puppe und einen kleinen Bettbezug, in dem wir wahllos Stoffstücke miteinander verbanden. Nähen war das Ziel, nicht ein Mittel, um Dinge herzustellen. Wir schwiegen beim Arbeiten. Manchmal half ich ihr stumm, einen Faden abzuschneiden oder ihn durch das Nadelöhr zu führen. Wir nähten, als ob wir versuchten, unsere Welt wieder zusammenzufügen und die Angst vor der erneuten Trennung in Schach zu halten. Während ich so neben meiner inzwischen siebenjährigen Tochter saß, zog sich meine Brust zusammen. Rachmas Anwesenheit war genauso schmerzhaft wie ihre Abwesenheit. Zum ersten Mal wurde mir klar, wie viele Welten in ihrem kleinen Körper Platz hatten. Früher wusste ich alles über sie, kannte jede Pore ihres Körpers, den Satzbau, wenn sie sprach, die neuen Wörter, die sie aufgeschnappt hatte, die Buchstaben, die sie nicht aussprechen konnte, die Mahlzeiten, die sie tagsüber zu sich nahm und ihre Lieblingsecke auf ihrer Decke. Und hier war sie nun. Eine stille, geheimnisvolle Person. Ihre Stille glich der eines schlafenden Vulkans, auf dessen Hügeln Rehe in völliger Gelassenheit umherstreifen. Ich dachte, wenn ich dir in die Augen schaue, weiß ich, wie viel passiert ist. Ein Blick geht zwischen unseren Augen hin und her und schwebt wie ein elektrischer Draht im Regen. Ein nachwirkender Blick, der still und doch unruhig ist, Liebevoll und doch flackernd, fragend und doch ängstlich, weil die Antworten ungewiss sind. Wie kann das alles in wenigen Wochen passieren? Und wie kann es sein, dass sich der Blick eines Kindes mit Sprache nicht beschreiben lässt? Das ist viel zu viel für dich, Rachma. Auch zu viel für mich und zu viel für eine Kindheit, die im Alter von sieben Jahren endete. So verging der erste Tag 
Und wir hatten noch zwei Tage und eine Nacht zusammen, bevor der nächste Abschied anstand. Am Morgen kochte ich ihr Lieblingsessen und beschloss, mit ihr einen Spaziergang am Fluss zu machen. Der schlummernde Vulkan, den ich am Vortag in ihren Augen gesehen hatte, konnte nicht länger ruhig bleiben und die friedlich umherstreifenden Rehe flogen in die Luft, als Rachma plötzlich zu weinen begann und schrie, »Warum bist du weggegangen, Mama? Warum hast du mich allein gelassen? Kommst du jetzt nie mehr in mein Zimmer?« Sie schluchzte auf und sagte dann, »Was ist passiert, Mama? Bitte komm zurück, ich habe so einen Herzschmerz.« Ich umarmte sie und wir weinten gemeinsam. Ich wusste, dass alle Begründungen unzureichend wären und alle Ausreden banal klingen würden. Ich wischte mir und ihr die Tränen ab und erklärte ihr, dass sie jede Woche drei Tage mit mir und vier Tage mit ihrem Vater verbringen werde. Sie spreizte ihre kleinen Hände und zählte drei Finger an ihrer rechten Hand ab und vier an ihrer linken. Aber warum soll ich länger bei Papa bleiben? Wegen der Schule, Liebes. Jeden Freitag holt dich dein Großvater nach der Schule ab und bringt dich zu mir. Und in den Ferien kannst du so lange bei mir bleiben, wie du willst. In den letzten Stunden von Rachmas Besuch saß sie auf meinem Schoß mit blassem Gesicht und panischem Blick. Sie starrte ständig auf die Uhr und fragte mich alle fünf Minuten, jetzt? Muss ich jetzt gehen? Ich küsste sie auf die Stirn und versicherte ihr, dass wir noch viel Zeit hätten. In der letzten Stunde wog die Zeit immer schwerer, denn ich sah, wie Rachma unter der Last der vergehenden Minuten zu schwanken begann. Ich sagte ihr mit ruhiger Stimme, pass gut auf dich auf und mach immer deine Hausaufgaben. Nächste Woche gehen wir schön spazieren und wir kaufen viele Spielsachen. Können wir nächstes Mal wieder nähen? fragte sie leise. Na klar. Ich spürte, dass sie nur an den Moment des Abschieds denken konnte. Und sobald dieser Moment käme, würde sie weinend weggehen, und ich würde mit meinem Kummer dastehen, unfähig, ihr Leid zu lindern oder die verdrehte Logik hinzunehmen, die mich zwang, so zu tun, als würde ich ihre Abwesenheit mit Nerven aus Stahl akzeptieren. Meine Aufgabe war es, ihr einen Teil ihres Schmerzes zu nehmen und ihre emotionalen Ausbrüche im Zaum zu halten. Ich überlegte ihr, einen Brief zu schreiben, den sie lesen konnte, wenn sie erwachsen war. Aber ich verwarf den Gedanken, weil ich wusste, dass mein Herz voller Glasscherben war und scharfe Gegenstände nicht in die Reichweite von Kindern gelangen sollten. Die ganze Woche über wartete ich auf das Wochenende, um Rachma wiederzusehen. Am Freitag beendete ich wie gewohnt meine Arbeit an der Universität, doch bevor ich losfuhr, fand ich auf meinem Schreibtisch eine Einladung zu einer internationalen Konferenz, die an der American University stattfinden sollte, mit dem Titel »Die Drosen«. Tausend Jahre Vielfalt feiern. Wo? College Hall, Auditorium B. Wann? 20. bis 21. November. So sehr ich mich über das Interesse der Universität an den Drusen freute, so wenig bedeutete mir diese Konferenz. Ich dachte an die Einschränkungen, die ich im Namen dieser Religion ertragen musste und an die Einschränkungen, die andere sich tausend Jahre lang im Namen der Religion selbst auferlegt hatten. Hatte ich tausend Jahre Einsamkeit und Isolation bezwungen, als ich im Morgengrauen das Haus von Salem verließ? Oder war es eine Schlacht gewesen, in der es keine Sieger gab? War ich jetzt frei? Oder war ich nur auf Bewährung frei, weil es nur eine Frage der Zeit war, bis mein Vater aus seiner Freundlichkeit erwachte oder die Scheichs erfuhren, dass ich allein in Beirut lebte? Und was wird das Schicksal meiner Tochter mit diesem Erbe sein? Vielen Dank, Alexandra Sagurna. In the novel you describe actually how the separation from her husband enables Amal to feel like a different kind of motherly love for Rahma that was already palpable in the excerpt we just heard. She, she transforms as a mother. What did you learn about yourself, about motherhood, while writing this novel? Actually, writing, all forms of writing are, like, they give us a reflective experience. Even keeping a journal um, gives us this uh, reflective uh, time. 
where we sit back and get to explore our thoughts and um, decisions in life. And writing this novel um, has helped me reconcile with the past. It has also helped me process a lot of um, feelings and thoughts that I haven't dealt with and maybe fears that I haven't faced, that I had just um, put in a closet. Um, and it also made me uh, raise new questions. And regarding the, the, the relation to our children, usually when they're young and we are overwhelmed with our own problems and issues in life, um, we don't enjoy them as much. But then they grow up so fast and we look back and said, I wish I have enjoyed this more because we were so overwhelmed. Um, we weren't there. We weren't fully there. And... Um, I get to see this now because, I mean, you know, things change in life and we might as well make the best out of each uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your novel, it was already mentioned, was published in Arabic last September and you already told us that you received lots of letters. Yeah. But were there any reactions from the Druze community because you address like taboo subjects in the novel. That's okay. correct. Uh, well, actually, the most expected uh, reactions were those of religious men, of course, who, um, upon hearing that the, the novel talks about uh, the, 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 the Druze community, which is a closed minority, they instantly thought that uh, I want to expose or condemn the, the community, which is not the case. But there's always this tiptoeing around minorities and like, you know, keep them in the dark. I don't know why it's important for them. Maybe because of the long history of persecutions. Mm -hmm. So this fear, uh, this existential fear is deeply entrenched in their uh, subconscious. So, so I understand. But the least expected reactions that I got were from women, very religious women, not only from the Druze community, but from other ultra-religious communities, um, who felt seen and heard by the novel. Um, they were so grateful that um, I got to bring to the light uh, the suffering and all the lives that, I, that they didn't have a say in, they just... Uh, set back and saw others making the decisions for them and they just had to accept. Mm. Yeah. Your novel could easily be categorized as a feminist novel, but it's a difficult term because what is a feminist novel mm. and how do you deal with such labels and what value do such labels have uh, in Lebanon where you, mm. the book was published? Was this a discussion people had? Yeah. Um, I understand uh, the urge for people to categorize everything, including books, like, you know, in order for each person to seek their interest. But when I first uh, started writing the novel, I did not think about writing a feminist novel. I wrote about the complexity of the relationships within the same family, about this, these walls that arise between us and the closest people. How does this happen? I wrote about love, motherhood, heartbreak, um, dreams, failures. Men had a major role in the novel. Um, so it's about all of these things. So um, I'm not a big fan of labeling uh, or categorizing books, but I understand and I don't mind it being called a, a feminist novel. I'm simply a woman who wrote a a novel from a viewpoint of a woman. Uh, I have a woman psyche, and I happen to exist on that end. Of <laughs> so this is how I experienced life, and this is how I wrote the novel. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are writers that say, um, I'm using my voice to tell a story only I could tell, and that's what you really did. You really told the story only you could tell. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them have in mind, I want to to make a change. I want, uh, I believe in the, the power of literature to mm. change things. 
Um, you told me that you hope literature could have a soothing effect. Um, what exactly do you mean by that? What do you hope your book will bring? Yeah, I mean, in this fast-paced world that we live in with all the conflicts and this, like, hasty life, that, lives that we live, I believe literature is an oasis for a person to just sit back, take a step back, and reflect not about only their life, but about the lives of others. It's an opportunity for for us to get out of ourselves and our monotonous problems and to get to encounter new worlds, get to bond with new characters, even on paper. And I think this is nice and soothing. And the empathy, when you feel empathetic towards others, this in itself is a soothing experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this first experience with your debut novel Did it give you the feeling, I want to do it again? <laughs> Actually, it did. It's like, it's hard to stop, especially when you feel celebrated and when you see like a lot of people are happy with it or grateful for it. And so yeah, it's tempting to keep on writing and that's what I plan on doing. Do you have already an idea in mind? Or? Yeah, I did start my second novel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. But you don't want to tell more at this point. Maybe later. Maybe yeah. later. So we are curious and we will hope that there will be a second book by you. Hopefully. And uh, I hope, um, zum Abschluss des Abends, habe ich die Autorin gebeten, selbst für uns auch nochmal auf Arabisch zu lesen. Es ist ein Gedicht, das auch Teil dieses Buchs ist. Und wir hören es, bevor wir es auch Arabisch hören, einmal auf Deutsch und danach wird Hanin al für sie lesen. Weil das Meer weit weg war, konnte ich nie ein Boot berühren. Ich lernte zu fliehen, aber das endete immer im Schlaf oder blieb ein Wunsch. So wurde das Anstarren der Decke zu meinem Boot. Ich studierte die Landkarten der Feuchtigkeit, erforschte die runden Lampen in den Bussen, bestaunte die rechteckigen in den Hörsälen. Ich suchte Gott in den Decken der Frauenkliniken, suchte seine Umarmung in den Neonleuchten der OPs. Als ich dich fand, hörte ich auf zu fliehen, doch das Anstarren der Decke blieb eine zahme Gewohnheit. Das letzte Mal, als ich neben dir lag, starrte ich auf in Stein gehauene Blumen. Sie waren weiß und dein Atem war ihr Duft. So wurde das Anstarren der Decke ein Fenster zum Garten Gottes. Is it my, my turn now? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna read this short poem in Arabic. I don't know how many people speak Arabic in here, but um, all right, let's do this. لأن البحر كان بعيدا ولم أكن قد لمست مركبا من قبل ولأن هروبي مهما بلغت شدته كان ينتهي بالنوم أو توسله أصبح التحديق بالسقف مركبي حفظت عن طريق الهروب خرائط الرطوبة في سقف كل بيت سكنته سكنته الأضواء المستديرة في أسقف الحافلات والبيضاء المستطيلة في قاعات المحاضرات بحثت عن الطريق إلى الله في خطوط أسقف عيادات الطب النسائي وعن حضنه في أضواء أسقف غرف العمليات حين وجدتك توقفت عن الهرب ولكن بقي التحديق في السقف عادة أليفة منزوعة الحرقة في آخر مرة استلقيت جنبك رحت أحدق بالزهور الصغيرة الناتئة التي تزين السقف فوق سريرنا كانت حجرية وبيضاء وكانت أنفاسك عبيرها حدقت بها كثيرا حتى أصبحت جزءا من قلبي وأصبح التحديق في السقف نافدة على حديقة الله فين دانك Thank you so much Hanin Und 
vielen Dank Alexandra Sagurna fürs Lesen heute Abend. Vielen Dank Ihnen allen, dass Sie da waren. Vielen Dank dem Literaturhaus, dass wir diesen Abend hier machen konnten. Machen Sie es gut. Tschüss.